Moving to Live is a podcast about movement and exercise. Along with our sister podcast, Fit Lab PGH, we have the ethos that movement is a lifestyle, not just an activity, because movement is part of what makes your life complete. Moving to Live interviews professionals in the movement field who have a variety of experiences, education, and professional titles. At the end of the day, we all want to move more, and we want our patients, athletes, or clients to move more or move better more efficiently, or move with less pain. Some of the people we interview you will have heard of. They're well-known in and outside of the movement and exercise professions. Others you may not have heard of, but they have a great deal of knowledge to share. Many people doing the best work spend their time working with people, not working on their social media presence. Each Moving to Live interview will be long enough to impart usable information, but short enough to be able to be consumed in a single listen, during your workout, commute, or even during dinner prep. Before we get to the interview, a quick request. If you like what you hear, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts and share the podcast with your friends or anyone who understands that movement is a lifestyle. We appreciate it, and our guests appreciate it too. Welcome back to another edition of Moving to Live. As you heard in the intro, along with our sister podcast, Fit Lab PGH, we are podcasts that promote the ethos that movement is a lifestyle, not just an activity, because movement is part of what makes your life complete. We really have the goal of making people or trying to make people think about movement as the normal rather than the abnormal. So as I was chatting with today's guest before we started recording, I mentioned sometimes we find guests from recommendations and sometimes we find guests by we see an interesting blog post and then we hunt them down on the internet trying to find out their mode of communication. I actually saw today's guest. She was written about in a podcast with the clothing company Kitspo and our sister podcast, uh, FitLab Pittsburgh Movement Tip Lifestyle Hack videos. You've probably seen us mention them before. And she had a podcast or she had a little blog post about what she does uh, partially, although she's a person who wears many hats, which is forest bathing, which we'll get into. She's a physician who has a number of different uh, areas of expertise. And as she said to me, she said, I'm not really into movement or fitness uh, as a professional, but I prescribe it to all my patients. So we are here today with Dr. Suzanne Bartlett Hackenmiller. She's told me I can call her Suzanne, so I don't have to try to butcher her name. She is a physician. She's living in Iowa, and she has a book that you should check out. I'm about two chapters in. I'm kind of jumping around in it. The Outdoor Adventurer's Guide to Forest Bathing. So Dr. Bartlett Hackenmiller, thanks for taking time to talk to Moving to Live. Thanks, Ben. It's fun to be here. I always start my moving to live interviews with what's your elevator spiel in a positive way. Maybe you get on an elevator once we're able to travel and go to conferences and maybe you had a book signing and you're carrying a copy of your book and somebody says, so, you know, what do you do? What do you tell people? That is a great question. Can you imagine being in an elevator again with people? So yeah, if I was carrying a bunch of books and people would say, what is that? Because it is one of those topics that people see forest bathing and they immediately say, what is that? Although I will say I get a lot less of that now than I did five years ago when I first started talking about and guiding forest bathing. But my elevator spiel would be something like, I started out as a conventional doctor in OBGYN, and then life happened, essentially because of my family, particularly the fact that I had a son who was diagnosed with autism and a a husband who was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and ultimately passed away from that. Those things started making me ask questions about what we were doing in medicine, both what is happening in the environment that contributes to the the conditions that we're dealing with. And also how do we support people with these different diagnoses in ways beyond pharmaceutical medications and surgery? So I discovered that there's this thing called integrative medicine had never even heard of integrative medicine in 2010 when it first crossed my psyche. Uh, But I learned about Dr. Andrew Weil. I heard him speak at a conference and learned that there is this concept of integrative medicine that combines conventional medicine with alternative and complementary approaches that are evidence-based. And so that really appealed to me because integrative medicine involves everything, things like nutrition, things like exercise, 
things like the mind body connection, looking at micronutrients, looking at the bigger picture and maybe things like whole medical systems, like traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and native American healing practices. Uh, it uses herbal medicine. It delves into important things like stress and sleep and how those impact our health. So I discovered that. And then Shortly into my fellowship, uh, my husband passed away. I discovered that I survived my uh, grief and the falling part, a part of my life by heading outside. And initially, my uh, my outdoor experience was all about the adrenaline rush. It was trail running. It was mountain biking. It was training for adventure triathlons. It was whatever I could do to be outdoors and moving as fast as I could. I had been practicing yoga for quite a while. And so at some point I recognized that I needed to balance the adrenaline rush with the quiet contemplative mind body practice and uh, discovered that there's this thing called forest bathing in 2014 and started experimenting with it with some participants in a workshop that I was leading a workshop series and realized that forest bathing, forest therapy was something I had been practicing along with my outdoor adventure and wanted to expand on it, study it more. I became certified as a forest bathing, forest therapy guide, um, served as the medical director for the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy, and really started using it as a treatment modality for my patients, getting outside in nature, imagine that. And so since that time, I don't know, this is a long elevator ride. We're going up to about the 2050th, I don't know, floor. Uh, but so since that time, I have had all kinds of opportunities related to nature, including writing the book that you mentioned, um, including doing a lot of speaking, even at medical conferences on this amazing notion of nature as a healing modality. I've worked with some other experts and researchers uh, to create a continuing medical education program on the topic of nature. And so, yeah, I'll stop there, but that's, that's kind of, uh, that's a long elevator ride. The good thing about talking to somebody who's doing something like this is you learn a lot. The bad thing is sometimes questions come up. So I'm going to jump around a little bit <laughs> and right. you kind of brought the question up and this is a good thing. You mentioned that you were a regular yoga practice pra practitioner, excuse me. Right. One of the things I've often wondered about, especially over the last year to 18 months is I, I think everybody will agree. All of us have stress in our lives. It's impossible to eliminate it. It's more about how we're able to not necessarily control with it, but deal with it or adapt mm -hmm. to what it is. And I recognized about two summers ago when I went to a conference in Washington, DC, and like you, I'm an outdoor mover. And of course, well, I'm in DC. I better get out before I go to the conference. And although I've lived in cities before, I've lived in a relatively, uh, I call it exurbia, about 25 miles from Pittsburgh for a number of years. So, you know, I go into Pittsburgh for a day or I go here and there. Um, but most of my time is spent in a relatively rural area. And the first thing I noticed was just the sublevel. This was the first time I'd ever noticed in a city, the sublevel of constant noise, whether it was traffic, whether it was air conditioners, whether it was, whatever it was. And I'm curious if, if you have had any thoughts or if you could hypothesize on why maybe yoga is so popular in cities, because for that hour or hour and 45 minutes that people go, that may be the only time that is relatively quiet in their life and quiet right. is in kind of air quotes. I wondered if Isn't you could that, comment yeah, on that. It's so interesting. And, and as an aside, I did my residency in Pittsburgh and lived there a total of five years. So I love the area that you live in. Um, and I can identify with that, um, that kind of humming background noise of being in a city and, and sometimes you don't notice that until you're away from it. And I think that's something that a lot of people realize when they first maybe take their first steps out of the city or into a wooded area, perhaps, or just a more natural area. But um, so, yeah, the question is, is why does yoga resonate? And I think that we do need stillness. I think it's, it's very important. And in fact, it's one of the things that is interesting about this notion of forest therapy or forest bathing because it was started in Japan in Tokyo 
um, in the in the 1980s by a couple of doctors who noticed exactly what you were just mentioning that there's just this constant noise and constant lights and hurriedness of living in a city and their patients in Tokyo were suffering from significant issues related to depression and anxiety and high suicide rates. And so they wondered if getting those people out of the city could be helpful for them for their mental health. And that's exactly what they discovered is that just taking them an hour outside the city into a wooded area and just allowing them to slow down and take nature in through the senses, enjoying the quiet, enjoying the, the sounds of nature and just being away from the din of the, of the sounds of a city. And they wondered if that would be good for them. And it turned out that it was. It turned out that it helped their participants in nearly really all areas of mental health. And these same doctors then started looking at physical parameters to see if it helped them physically to be out in nature and Yes. Is it the quietness? I think that it's certainly a component of it. So I'm not sure if that answered your question about yoga per se. It, it didn't really answer per se, but it, ga it gave me more room. And I think to think about, and I think it gave our listeners, although I think those of us who spend significant out time outside, especially when camping of, the, of that time, when you pick the camping spot where the peepers are out, we would argue that it isn't super, super quiet. If you could figure out a way to make those peepers be quiet so you could get, a, <laughs> get to sleep, you'd like it. Right. You know, but if you think about yoga, that uh, I did my yoga class today from home via Zoom, which I've been doing during the pandemic, and it isn't always quiet when we're doing yoga, whether we're at home or in a yoga studio or outdoors, there's all kinds of ambient sounds wherever we are, but that's exactly what yoga is all about, is teaching us to be less reactive to outer stimuli, and so that we go inward and we focus on our breathing. We focus on the asana. We focus on our, um, you know, our muscle movements and, and all of these things. And, and it's all about teaching us to be less reactive to stress, less reactive to anger and frustration and all of the things that assault us in our daily life. And so, so yeah, I think that applies to the sounds and the noise and the stress of a city. And I've been in yoga studios in cities and they're not perfectly quiet. You hear the sounds of outdoors and it's all about being able to just to witness those things um, and, and to be with it and breathe through it. I know I've mentioned this before on the podcast with people I've talked to, and it seems mostly with endurance, uh, people involved in endurance sports. But there are a lot of them, myself included, are like you. It's like, how fast can I go? How far can I go? You know, what cool race can I go to? And for a lot of them, myself included, it seems, and in no way am I asking you to say how old you are, but somewhere around the time they hit 35 or 40 years of age, plus or minus five years, it's kind of like, yeah, those things are still important, but even more important if they're just, uh, for example, a mountain biker. It's just getting out there. Right. And it's like, rather than saying, boy, what's this cool mountain bike race that I can do or this long tour? It's like, boy, you know, if I can just get out on my mountain bike more, that seems to be. And I, I know for me, I'd much rather go for a hike or a trail run in the woods with my dogs than go do a 5K. And if you told me when I was 30 years old, that's what I was going to do. I'd say, yeah, you're crazy. I want to get more T-shirts, more medals, <laughs> more, more races. You know, how many can I do? Yes, that's what I've found too. So I'm curious, uh, two hands with the forest bathing, we'll get into the professional aspect first, but obviously you had tremendous stress and discomfort that was caused by the death of your spouse and stress caused by having a, a, a son with autism. And I can see where the endurance activities and how fast, how far can I go? What was your thought or what was your thought process if you recall or say, boy, you know, I need to slow down and do something else in the outside. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the people that you trained with or raced with, what was their comment? Where they say, you're crazy, Suzanne, or boy, this, this is something I've been looking for too. No, I think that I realized I needed both. I just needed to have balance. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. So doctors who specialize in such things as obstetrics and emergency medicine and general surgery <laughs> and things like that tend to be adrenaline junkies to start with. And so 
Um, so I, I started to recognize that I was dealing with burnout from my job, um, too much call, you know, all of the stress of being an obstetrician and often a solo obstetrician, um, having to run out of the house in the middle of the night to go deliver a baby. You can imagine that that can weigh on you. And so, so I've always had this predisposition to be an adrenaline junkie and a very wise healer once told me that I should not derive my adrenaline, uh, rush from my work. I should seek it elsewhere. So I acknowledge that for me personally, I do need some of that just to maintain my sanity. But yet, yes, I also had enough wherewithal through my training, I guess, um, through being, I think through studying yoga and, um, and then through the mind body, um, things that I learned during my fellowship to realize that we can't always be go, go, go. And we do need to have the quiet time, reflect the reflective time. We need to develop that, um, ability to deal with reaction and, and the calming. So did I, let's see, what was the real question there? I'm sorry that I so, sort of digress. <laughs> I don't think you really digressed. I, th- I think you covered it uh, on the second aspect of that with yeah. the, when you started to discover forest bathing and started mm-hmm. recommending to patients, if you can think back to yeah. some, some of your colleagues, maybe not the close colleagues, oh, right. what oh, was, what so was yeah. their, what was their response? Yeah, yeah, Did they yeah. look at you like you were crazy? Yeah. I couldn't remember how, what the second part of the question was. So first of all, I trained with a group of women for these adventure triathlons. And, uh, one of the, my close friend was also my yoga teacher. And yet she was all about mountain biking and all that too. So we, we actually developed a program for women in our area that involved both the training for these races, but also incorporated yoga, incorporated a number of empowerment types of things. And then later I added in forest bathing to it too. So, so, you know, I surrounded myself with like-minded people. And so fortunately most of them didn't think I was as crazy as one might. Um, But then when I'm, thinking back to how I started doing this with patients and the general public, because you're right, people, and I'm in Iowa, which is maybe not the most forward thinking place on the planet. Uh, but, but yes, when I started offering forest bathing walks, people thought I was losing my mind was certifiably nuts, but I did broach it in an insidious way because like I said, I was doing this workshop series. And so I just decided to experiment with people. And so I took them out on this walk at this center, this beautiful retreat center into the woods and, and just did some little experimental forest bathing on them. And they didn't know that I was doing it really. But afterwards I told them what we had done and, um, and just thought, well, we'll just see what happens. They returned for the following week because it was a weekly workshop series. And I was astonished to learn that most of the people in my group, and it was like 20, 25 people had gone out during the intervening week and taken either themselves and or family members out doing forest bathing, just like we had done in my little experiment. So that was when I discovered that this really, really is big medicine because it, you know, you couldn't have staged it better. If I had, if I had given them the assignment to go out and do this between the two weeks, they never would have done it. And it just happened organically that they were so moved by the practice. It did something to them. It, it changed them in a way that they wanted to do it again on their own and, or they wanted to take their spouse or their kids or somebody else out and show it to them. So that's when I started realizing, okay, there is something to this crazy idea in my head. And so I explored it further. And I know people are probably listening to this and they're wondering, (laughs) it's like, okay, forest bathing. Well, I trail run or I ride my mountain bike or, or I do, I do hiking on the weekends how does forest bathing differ or is that a form of forest bathing? Yeah. Well, so forest bathing is in its purest form is not a hike. It's not a nature identification walk. It's not, uh, it's not time spent in nature with any agenda other than to just take nature in. And we, as 
certified, trained forest therapy guides consider it similar to being a yoga teacher where you can help a person guide them to do this in a more mindful way. Because you can imagine that if you just decided to start practicing yoga without any guidance, you might not do very well. Um, and so forest therapy is a similar way in which we, we take people in a sequential fashion from the everyday monkey mind stressed out state that people typically arrive with through a series of what we refer to as invitations that allow them to go kind of deeper into kind of a dreamlike state and out of that crazy conscious stressed out state. We, we consider it similar to being in a, a dreamlike state, kind of a subconscious state. And once you get there, that's where all kinds of different magic happens. But it's all done by um, invitations that lead the participant to take nature in in, a, in various different ways through the senses. And we're in the middle of COVID. I'm not sure what situations are in Iowa. In Pennsylvania, it's still pretty locked up tight. Yes. And, you know, you're probably not going to have 25 or 30 people going out on a forest bathing activity, even if you are able to keep the social distancing, right. I think. So what do you do or what have you been for doing? For the most to part, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted. But for the most part, um, we have not been doing in-person walks Um some people have with small groups and using masks and things, but there are a lot of us who are doing virtual walks, if you can imagine that. And it's something that you could certainly listen to somebody. We could do it as a podcast. We have done it on Facebook Live, various different ways where somebody can listen to, I've done it through Zoom also, um, where basically I would guide a person. They could do it in their own backyard. They could be at a park or a wooded area by themselves. Any natural area works. It's not all about being in a forest per se. But yeah, this can be done in any number of ways. And I guess one of the things that um, you mentioned in the previous question was how this applies to the adrenaline type of things. And is it something you can do while hiking or trail running or mountain biking. And, and that's what I discovered that I do. And that was what inspired the book that I wrote, uh, The Outdoor Adventurer's Guide to Forest Bathing. Like, how could you combine? Because for me, that's that works really well to be able to uh, be on a long trail run, hating my life sometimes in the heat or whatever, climbing up a hill on a bike or running. Um, and if I can become more mindful in that moment, it helps to pass the time. It helps everything really. And so I might just focus on looking for things that are a certain color or something as simple as that. Or, um, and so I, um, in the book that I wrote, ended up uh, creating invitations for all of these different outdoor adventures, ways that you could kind of combine forest bathing with your adrenaline rush. Cause I'm all about the multitasking. <laughs> We're talking with Suzanne uh, Bartlett Hackenmiller. She is a physician and author of the book, The Outdoor Adventurer's Guide to Forest Bathing. I think one of the questions we have to ask is, we all know in traditional medicine, unless you're in a special situation, if you get more than 15 to 20 minutes with a patient, it's outstanding. And very often it's less than that. I don't think I'm sharing any secrets. How did you, or how do you introduce it to your uh, patients? And what was, I'm sure now, because your people are more aware of who you are, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's the crazy forest lady. <laughs> but you know, in 2014, 2015, when you would have a patient, how did you get the time to talk about it a little bit as part right. of their treatment? And what were some of the crazy responses you got? Well, it is interesting. And I, I, I have multi faceted, a, a multifaceted practice. So I do have my GYN patients who are, are some of whom are more um, conventionally minded. And we are just kind of dealing with your typical uh, conventional GYN issues. Um, I also see patients in integrative medicine where we do try to spend more time getting to the root of the problem and looking at a, um, a, an integrative approach to dealing with it. And in, with those patients, I definitely look at everything. As I said before, we look at nutrition, we talk about exercise, we talk about mind-body practices. And, and in those patients, for sure, I squeeze in nature as a prescription. But it, I do often mention it to 
patients in my, even in my GYN clinic. And I'll say, doctor's orders, get outside today, go for a walk. It might even be something as simple as that. But it might be something that's a little more prescribed. It might be that I recommend that you find whatever it is that you enjoy doing outside, spend 30 minutes doing it as many times a week as possible. There's some research that suggests that 120 minutes per week might be kind of a sweet spot for time spent in nature. And I think it's interesting and very similar to that idea that 150 minutes of exercise is what we need minimum, I would say. And I would say 120 minutes of nature is minimum. But isn't that interesting that 120 and 150 are really pretty close? And I think that it's fascinating when science confirms what we already know, but we know that we are intended to be outdoor beings. Most of the several million dollar, million dollar, several million years that we've been evolving on this planet have been outdoors. And it's only been in the last couple of hundred years that we've spent increasingly more time indoors, just like we've been during our evolution, more active creatures it's only been in the last couple of years that we've spent so much time sitting and not moving. So I think those things go hand in hand, the, the importance of movement and the importance of time spent outdoors. When you think about the time outdoors, and I know you mentioned that you came into forest bathing after more time as quote unquote, an adrenaline junkie. Do you think uh, some of the people who are doing the outdoor activities, whatever it is, whether they're the adrenaline drunkies, the trail runners, I mean, we, I think we all know that the people who are doing the endurance and the ultra endurance things outside, there has to be some, you know, I'm just going to run until I see that four leaf clover or something like that, rather than <laughs> focusing all the time, unless you are just an incredible mental creature. Do you think some of those people at some level subconsciously realize I do this and I do these activities outdoors as opposed yes. to, or in nature, as opposed to running on the street? I know there are some people just as an example who are runners. Um, and by choice, it's like, look, I'm going to drive 25 minutes to go to trails, right. even if I can run out my front door. Do you think there's something in some people that there just- There definitely in is. In fact, I interviewed all kinds of people for my book from- friends and you know acquaintances to some elite athletes in every one of the different activities I wrote about in the book and so um I even I did some surveys of trail running groups I, I asked all kinds of people all kinds of questions exactly like that is there some reason that you choose to run on a dirt trail as opposed to on a paved road or sidewalk or whatever. And uh, I ask questions like, is it easier on your joints? Which a lot of people say trail running is as opposed to running on pavement. Um, is there something about nature that seems to be the reason you do it? And, and interestingly, yes, everybody did say that, that there is something that makes it better to be out in the woods or running along a coast or you know, mountain biking in the desert, as opposed to road cycling, or, you know, there was something, it was a re recurring theme. It was so interesting to me that, that I just kept hearing that same kind of thing from all of the people I interviewed, that there is something special about being in nature. And there is something that drives me to do that, as opposed to, as you mentioned, running out my front door. And I do that. I will drive to a trailhead. I do it all the time, or I'll even put my bike on my vehicle or in my vehicle and drive to a trailhead as opposed to riding or running out my front door. I just would rather spend my time getting there sooner than yeah, running there, riding there. I think it's interesting you say that. I think some of us realize it and look for an excuse as to why we're doing it. I mentioned before we started recording that I lost a dog coming up on two years ago who had idiopathic epilepsy. And I knew when she started to drag her rear legs and the neurologist uh, for her said, you know, you need to take her to softer surfaces if you're going to walk her. So one of my goals was the last uh, two years of her life is we went almost every day to parks and trails and basically went at her pace. Yeah. And I remember doing that. I mean, you know, that she had her follow-up visit and her, her paws looked better and 
know, the vet said, yeah, this is good. Keep doing it. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And I'm driving home with my girlfriend. And I remember saying to her, it's like, you know, I'm a dumbass. I always would say to my clients or my patients when I worked as an athletic trainer, you know, if you're having joint injuries, go on soft surfaces because it's easier for you. So I went on soft surfaces for my dog and I realized, oh, I feel so much better. I don't have that ache and pain in my unstable ankle. My legs aren't dead the next day. I have more fun when I go and bike because my legs are fresher. And even though she's no longer there, I still preferentially put my dogs in the car, drive anywhere from 10 minutes to 25 minutes to walk them on soft surfaces. So, That's so great. I think one of the things that people miss out on, and I, I, I hear uh, we've seen this with the pandemic. So many people say, well, what do I do? You know, my, my gym is closed or it's right. restricted or I can't go. it, And I am just saddened and shocked that more people don't say, go for a walk. I mean, there are right. some people who are doing that, but if we could get more people to go for a walk, go for a walk in the woods, maybe that's not officially forest bathing, but there has to be some benefit that transfers over. And if it's something that improves the quality of life or helps manage the stress better than the, what they were doing, I think one of the things I've taken, as I said at the beginning, I've only read uh, one and a half chapters of your book. It's not an all or none. I mean, there's so much in exercise and movement. It's like all or not. It's like, well, if you're going to exercise, you you should do, you know, three times, five times a week for 150 to 240 minutes. Well, the majority of the population doesn't do that. So how can people take more control and how can we, those of us who are not certified forest bathers or certified forest bathing instructors, how can we introduce people to this and encourage people that, look, you don't have to have an organization, although that is beneficial, get outside and do something. What are some suggestions you might have? Absolutely. So first of all, I spent most of my early adult life working out in gyms and fitness centers. And for some reason that was okay. Like that, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take an hour after work or before work or whatever to work out. And I discovered that early on when I was, like I mentioned shortly after my husband died in 2012, I realized that I would get on my bike and mountain bike for an hour. And at first I would have this sense of guilt. Like I shouldn't be doing this. This is really, um, this is, this is frivolous and um, indulgent to be out riding my bike in the middle of a day or after work or before work or whatever. And then suddenly I realized this is no different than going to the gym for an hour. I should allow myself and encourage myself to do this and not have any guilt. I should, this is, this is exercise. It just happened that I realized it was more enjoyable for me. And in many times I got a better workout when I was outside than when I was in the gym, because I wasn't staring at the numbers on the treadmill or the bike or whatever, I was enjoying it. Um, But interestingly, there are all kinds of studies now. And this is what's so fun about it is there are studies finding that it doesn't matter what you do out in nature, as long as it's something you enjoy doing. So you don't have to be forest bathing. You don't have to go forest bathing with a guide. You don't have to do any prescribed anything outside other than what you love to do outside. If it's walking on a trail, that's what you should do. If it's bird watching, you should do that. If it's fishing, if it's biking, if it's sitting, there's a practice we call sit spot, which involves sitting for 20 minutes, doing nothing other than just noticing what you notice. And that's really good for the mind body. And I highly recommend doing sit spot after you do your exercise outdoors in nature. But whatever it is, there have been a number of studies that are recently finding that if you do your chosen activity for 30 minutes outdoors, that has health benefits. One of the studies found that 30 minutes outdoors improves our uh, stress hormone levels in our saliva, specifically salivary cortisol and salivary alpha amylase. And so 30 minutes of doing something, your preferred activity outdoors improves, lowers your stress hormones in your saliva substantially, significantly. And that something happens at about 20 to 30 minutes. That's the cutoff. That's the minimum amount of time to derive, to, to get that benefit. 
Uh, there's another study that found that rumination was decreased after participants spent 30 minutes walking in a natural setting. And so rumination is that thing where your mind just keeps going in circles. Just imagine lying in bed at night, ruminating, thinking of some stressful thing that you cannot get out of your mind, just in that vicious cycle of dread and stress. Um, 30 minutes outdoors in nature doing the activity of your choice was found to reduce that rumination when they looked at people's brains in functional MRI machines. So, you know, we just keep finding out more and more that time spent in nature doing whatever it is you like to do out there is good for you. It's interesting. I haven't gotten to the sit spot section of the book yet, but uh, people always are talking to one another about what's going on with COVID and what you've lost or what you've gained. And where I currently live, I have a little over four acres. And when I moved in 11 years ago, I was like, I'm going to build walking trails and mountain bike trails. And I think yeah. you can recognize what happened for 10 or 11 years. Nothing happened. It's like, oh, yeah, I need to do that. Well, the okay. pandemic offered the perfect opportunity. And last spring, we were able to do some very mellow trails, which are, which are nice. So now I can actually do this forest bathing type activity or movement from my back door or from my front mm, door. Perfect. But one of the things that uh, the sit stay, I realized and you said that uh, the people you interviewed in your book, many of them seem to seek something out is as I'm building these trails, it's like, this is a perfect spot for a deck. And it's like, well, you can't build a deck here. And the, the project, the, the, uh, the foot, well, the footers actually came in last week and we've cleared land. So once the snow disappears, we're actually building a deck in the middle of mellow mountain bike trails for that very purpose. As you said, Perfect. if you want a little quiet, you go out and you, you sit on the deck. The, the only thing we're looking for is uh, researching what's safe to bring the Labradors out so they can sit on the deck and not sit on pressure treated lumber. Oh, I love it. I think that's absolutely great. And we all need breaks. Um, yeah, I, I love it. It's perfect. You could do yoga out there too. <laughs> that would be my girlfriend. Uh, as, as you said, pick things that you enjoy. And although okay. I have taken yoga in the past, I've realized that that's one of those activities that for me, it's not good. It's, it's yeah. interesting that you said, pick things that you enjoy or find absolutely. useful. Absolutely. We interviewed for our, our local podcast, Fit Lab Pittsburgh, a gentleman who teaches meditation and Tai Chi. And the idea of me sitting there in a room on a meditation cushion just uh, sent shivers up my spine. And it's a talking to the gentleman. I said, you know, I, I just can't do that. I said, you know, but yeah. I get out in the woods. And this was before I was aware of forest bathing. And he said, well, Ben, that's your meditation. You going out and you walking or running along the trail with there your you dogs go. or stopping. And I think one of the things you hit on that I think more people, if they take it away, one message away from this particular interview is you essentially gave yourself permission to go biking outdoors rather than feeling guilty. And I think with movement or doing something that maybe doesn't necessarily have a concrete goal, like if I put together this bookcase, I'll have a place to store my books, right. but just, I'm going to go do something that I enjoy the quality of life stress relief has to be improved. And I'm not sure why more people don't do it rather than doing things that's like, well, I'm supposed to go to the gym rather than right. I don't want to go to the gym. I just want to take a walk in my backyard. Right. Absolutely. Permission is the perfect word for it. And it, it really was something that I had to reckon with because for some reason it seemed acceptable to go to the gym, but it did not seem acceptable. Uh, you know, it, at the time, my kids were young enough that I still had to deal with childcare. So I would think I should be getting home. I shouldn't be out riding my bike of all things. That's completely inappropriate. <laughs> but it turns out that it was one of the best things I could have done for all aspects of my health. And we all know, my kids certainly know that I'm a better parent when I have gotten outside and done it. If, if there are two things that I personally need for my mental health and, and my physical health, but definitely my mental health. If I have neglected exercise and time outdoors for more than two or three days, everybody knows it. And my family will tell me to go outside and ride my bike or go for a run. And we all know what my medicine is. It's interesting you say that when I, uh, I didn't find this out until a couple of years into my PhD studies, but when I went to study at Auburn University, the gentleman who had recommended I go there and who's kind of one of my mentors had told my major professor, 
uh, I'm probably paraphrasing, but if Ben's ever an ass or a bear, send him out for a run and he'll be much better. And I remember hearing that and thinking, well, that's not me. You know, I can control it. But now (laughs) as I'm older and more mature, the trigger point or the micro level for me seems to be most days, 40 to 45 minutes outside. So you mentioned the 30 minutes or the 120 or 20 uh, uh, minutes a, a week. And I think if anybody's listening to this, one of the things they might take away from it is rather than saying, oh, you know, Dr. Susie said, this is how long you should be. Just try something, you know, try it for maybe 10 minutes, if 10 minutes is good, or, or don't even, don't even set a clock. I'm, I'm sure people who are right. runners or bicyclists, if you, if you're, uh, especially now with Garbins and, and various GPSs, sometimes mm-hmm. they don't work and you finish that activity and it's like, well, you know, that was only 20 minutes. And then you get back to the car and it's like, no, that was an hour and a half. Right. That's, tr- that's so true. Um, hmm, I just had a thought. It totally left me. So I'm curious. Oh, I, I know what it was. Sorry. Um, so much like with exercise, you know, how they've said, it doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter if your 150 minutes occurs in hour long increments or 10 minute increments. I think that's been an interesting finding that I've, I've shared a lot with my patients over the last few years that if you're getting 10 minutes of exercise a few times during the day, and it all adds up to that 150 minutes, somehow that all works out. It counts. We're finding a similar kind of thing with nature and that it, it doesn't have to be in, it doesn't have to be a great big excursion to a national park. That's what people often think of as a nature experience, that it has to be some grandiose thing. It can also be five minutes sitting on your back porch, gazing at the flowers or a tree or something like that. It can even be technically, I'm finding, especially during COVID, that nature interaction can even be gazing out a window if you're stuck inside. It can be interacting with a potted plant. But again, much like with exercise, some of the studies are finding that yes, 20, 30 minutes is great. 120 minutes per week seems to be a sweet spot. But there was even one study that looked at college students and found that five minutes outdoors in nature improved all aspects of their mental health. So just becoming, you know, disconnecting from your devices for five minutes outdoors had benefit. So, so yeah, what if we just allowed ourselves to have those little little snippets of both exercise and nature, or maybe sometimes one without the other. Um, but, but trying to get somewhere in that 120 to 150 minutes per week. I'm thinking for those people who are fortunate enough to have even small patios, it would be fairly easy to set your patio up with a variety of plants where literally your outdoor time could be sitting there having a cup of coffee or relaxing Whereas otherwise you might be inside surfing the internet or watching television. Most definitely. And we know that that's good for our our brains and our minds and even our physical health to do that. Forest bathing. What about with children? Have you had any experience working with children or possibly you mentioned one of your children has autism? Have you noticed any benefits of with with him? I have. Yeah. It's great for kids. You know, the funny thing about kids is they're forest bathing all the time when you're All you have to do is take kids outside and that's what they do. And really what my participants have discovered when we're doing forest therapy, forest bathing, is that it's just like being a kid playing outside. And, and really that's all it is, is that we need to get back to that ability to just go outside and see what happens and, and lose a little inhibition and have fun and play with stuff. Uh, but kids are natural forest bathers. They're inquisition. And, you know, they stop and pick up little rocks and pine cones and things. They're just constantly looking at things and wanting to climb things and play on things and under things and in the water and float things in the water. I mean, that's that's forest therapy right there for you. So kids are a blast. Um, I have done a number of walks for special populations Um, people with special needs and things. And uh, it can be very interesting. Some people, you know, autism, we always say, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So some people with autism love forest bathing. I have one guy uh, who comes to every walk I do. He loves it. I have done uh, forest bathing with people who have hated it. (laughs) 
<laughs> so they have people with autism have a huge range of sensory challenges and issues and likes and dislikes. And so, so it would be impossible to say that it, it's something that's great for people with autism. For some people, it's amazing. For some people, it's torture. I'm also thinking as you're talking, especially we're in the middle of COVID, what about people who uh, have chronic illnesses or diseases where they're forced to be in the hospital? I'm thinking people wait, waiting for yeah. organ transplants, et cetera. Has there been any work in the forest bathing field for introducing the opportunity for these patients to potentially see some of the benefits? There is. There's all kinds of research constantly emerging. Uh, one of the more famous studies was in 1985, so quite a while back, uh, the Ulrich study, uh, where they found that people who were post-surgical, who had a, a hospital room with a view of a tree, as opposed to a hospital room with a view of like, a, you know, an air conditioner on top of a roof or something, you know, a, a non-natural scene, the people who had a room with a view of a tree had uh, statistically significantly shorter length of stay, overall length of stay by one whole day. They required fewer pain medications and had overall fewer complaints during their hospitalization just by being able to look out the window and see a tree. So they've extrapolated on that and, um, offered people uh, artwork for their hospital room and found that having artwork that is a natural scene versus, you know, again, industrial kind of picture or something like that, that that has benefits on, on length of stay, on need for pain medicine, on all of these different kinds of things. So, so yeah, um, there are a number of hospitals in different parts of the country and in different parts of the world where they have healing gardens where pa patients and um, healthcare providers can spend time just getting outside um, and being able to interact with plants. And there are even some indoor gardens too, I will mention, but, uh, but yeah, just being able to have some of those experiences is, is really healing. And I say this semi tongue in cheek and semi seriously, and I think you'll appreciate it. The healing gardens are where you should go for the healing, not to smoke your cigarette when you're on your smoke break. Yes. And typically the healing gardens that are specifically for that purpose would not allow smoking, but you're right. Unfortunately, we still struggle with that at, even at hospitals where people want to take a smoke break. Ah. <laughs> Everybody thinks technology is the newest and best. I mean, one of my comments is the great thing about social media is there's all these opportunities to see things and do things. The bad thing about social media is there's all these opportunities. What about forest bathing? If somebody was watching, for example, a forest scene playing on a loop on a computer screen or a television screen, are there, <laughs> are there similar benefits? Well, there, yeah, they, um, some of the, these same doctors in Japan who coined the term forest bathing have done some studies looking at pictures of nature on a computer screen and even those uh, have found improvements, you know, so they can look at their brains. You've probably seen these functional MRI studies and it's so interesting and, and similar types of things that they're finding improved mental health and um, changes in those rumination centers and all of those kinds of things, even from looking at a, a, a screen of a natural scene. So yes, probably not a bad idea because of course, Screens and technology are here to say, stay and we need them. We wouldn't be able to have this conversation right now where we can see each other from across the country and have this conversation in real time. I'm so glad that we can do that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with technology. It's all about balance, just like it's about balance between the adrenaline rush and the, the quiet more mindful time. It's all about balance for everything. I think we can use, there are apps that we can use um, to help us to navigate a trail, to help us have security and feel safe while we're out in nature. Uh, we can send our planned route to a family member so that they know where we're supposed to be and when and things like that. There are so many good reasons to have a phone with you when you go outdoors. I would never recommend that somebody not have a phone with them, but it could be turned off. It can be on silence. It can be in your pocket, um, in your backpack. 
we're not going to get rid of technology, but we can use it more wisely. I'm curious if there are these studies out there that show the improvement as far as a reduced hospital stay, reduced number of pain meds, et cetera. Why are not more physicians and more hospitals pushing for this? Why is it not why is it not the standard? For example, I would think if I was a physician doing surgery, and obviously I'm not a physician, you know, if I could have a better quality of care of my patients, my office would be full of plants. And I would, I would do little things like that, which could have a potential big effect. Well, this is a complicated question because unfortunately our system in this country is a sick care system and not truly a healthcare system. So why don't all doctors talk with their patients about nutrition and exercise and mind body practices and things like that? They should, it's not currently incorporated in most medical school curriculums or most residency programs. It certainly wasn't a part of mine. It wasn't even a thought. It never even occurred to me. The amount of time that was spent on nutrition and exercise in my medical training and education was nil until I did my residency or my fellowship, I'm sorry, in integrative medicine. So There are competing factors. Unfortunately, hospitals do need to fill their hospital beds. So I would like to think that all doctors and all hospital administrators wanted people to be in the hospital for shorter lengths of stay, but unfortunately that's not the reality that we have. I'm hopeful that at some point it does become a healthcare system where we look at the whole patient and all of the factors that we know influence health from all of these things that we've talked about today, because there is evidence to support exercise as a healing modality. There is evidence to support nature and nutrition and all of these things that we inherently intuitively know are good for us. And yet we have all of these other competing uh, things, commercials, ads, uh, you should eat this crap processed food. You don't, you know, you should spend more time on this technology, which we know deep down is not what we need, but there are lots of competing factors, unfortunately. I I know one of the things that can immediately be improved on by most people, I've I've said this to my dad before, and I think now at 86, he's kind of picking up on it, is most of us have a tendency to spend more time looking for a mechanic for our car than we do even within if we're controlled by the insurance by insurance by the physicians we can use, but looking for a physician who is a good fit for us. That is unfortunately very true. So I think one of one of the take home messages if people are listening to this is like, look, take control of your health. And I think uh, Dr. Bartlett Hackenmiller has given some really good insight of if you're not a mover, if you're not an exerciser, you don't necessarily have to be. Go outside on your patio or go to a, go to a local park and just sit down and go <sighs> spend a few minutes. I want to thank Dr. Suzanne Hackenmiller for spending some time talking to Moving to Live about forest bathing. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was a conversation I've wanted to have since probably very shortly after the pandemic started. I highly encourage uh, you go, go to Amazon and check out her book, The Outdoor Adventurer's Guide to Forest Bathing. There's more to the title, but I'll butcher the words and that'll get enough. <laughs> Thank you very much for spending a few minutes with uh, Moving to Live and giving us a little bit more information about forest bathing. Thanks, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Moving to Live. Make sure you check out the show notes for contact information for our latest guest, as well as links about the things we talked about. Intro and exit music is Traveling Light by Jason Shaw. You can subscribe to Moving to Live wherever you find podcasts or on our website, www.moving2live.com. Please tell your friends about Moving to Live and check out our sister podcast, FitLab PGH, F-I-T-L-A-B-P-G-H.com, which focuses on people, businesses, events, and activities in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area that make movement a priority because movement is a lifestyle, not just an activity. Until next time, keep on moving.